In Bolivia, a police officer arrested the governor of the Department of Santa Cruz, Luis Fernando Camacho, as part of the investigations into the coup d'etat case. In Peru, former President Pedro Castillo reiterates his innocence and blames President Dina Boluarte for the social chaos the country is experiencing. In the United States, Winter Storm Elliot has left a total of 65 people dead so far, but authorities estimate the number could rise. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Terzo Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Bolivia, the governor of the Department of Santa Cruz was detained by the country's police forces. According to the authorities, the official is accused of terrorism for promoting the 36-day strike in that jurisdiction to demand the advancement of the population census. The police intercepted Camacho aboard a vehicle and later transferred him to the international airport for Viro Viro to take him to La Paz City, where the accusations against him are being filed. Camacho was also being investigated by the prosecutor's office for the political crisis of 2019, when the coup d'etat promoted by the right wing against former President Evo Morales was consummated. In Argentina, the organization Ground Mothers of Plaza de Mayo announced Wednesday that they had successfully identified the 132nd missing grandchild. The organization highlighted this identity restitution as a case that renews hopes of this path of truth, memory, justice, and identity. The Grand Mothers of Plaza de Mayo provided details during a press conference at the House for Identity in the Space of for Memory and Human Rights. After documentary research and thanks to DNA studies, the grandson was able to confirm that Mercedes del Valle Morales was his mother. Mercedes was kidnapped along with part of her family on May 20, 1976, in Monteros, Tucumán. Her son was only nine months old. The announcement takes place less than a week after the successful identification of the 131st missing grandchild. The president-elect of Brazil, Lisson Nasser da Silva, will announce all the ministers who will be part of his new government ahead of his inauguration on January 1st. The Brazilian leader arrived on Tuesday to the country's capital after being in Sao Paulo for Christmas holidays and is expected to choose who will occupy the vacant positions in his new cabinet of ministers. Lula has already announced 21 members of his future government, including the surprising appointment of Vice President-elect Geraldo Admin as head of industry and commerce last week. In addition, the president highlighted through his Twitter account that his government will represent a new beginning for the country with more democracy and rights for the Brazilian people. With conflicting positions from opposing parties and labor unions, the Uruguayan Senate passed Wednesday a bill to reform the pension system with a total of 18 votes. The ruling National Party argues that the present pension system is not financially feasible in the short and long terms, given the country's low birth rate and the increased life expectancy of Uruguayans. They say the reform will allow its deficit to be curtailed to just 1.8% of the GDP and that the new retirees will enjoy higher pensions for longer years. Meanwhile, opposition parties have quite a different take on it. They argue the reform cuts benefits, increases retirement age from 60 to 65, and mostly favors the private sector. They also add that one out of three citizens does not have a 30-year employment record by the age of 65, as required by the law. The bill will be discussed by the lower house of the Uruguayan parliament next February. On Wednesday, Uruguay's state-owned energy company announced a 3.5% increase in electricity bills as of January 1, 2023. The Board of Directors of the country's National Administration of Power Plants and Electric Transmissions have decided on the adjustment. Such an increase is above half of the inflation projected by the government for the coming year, which is around 6.7%. According to local media, the broad front director in the company, Fernanda Cardona, opposed the measure and is in favor of keeping residential bills frozen.
The former president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, reiterated his innocence and described Dina Boluarte's government as a tyrannical. In this regard, the former president blamed the new president for the social situation the nation is experiencing. After the Congress decided to dismiss him on December 7 for allegedly committing rebellion, in view of this, Castillo's family was forced to leave the country following the political persecution against him. Likewise, the declarations of the former head of state take place while the appeal process against the Let us take a short break, but first remember you can follow us on TikTok at the account at Telesur English, in which you'll be able to see news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Heavy rains death toll in the Philippines has risen to 29 as a result of flooding. According to reports from rescue agencies, work is still underway to search for another 26 reported missing. Likewise, the National Risk Reduction and Disaster Management Council indicated that 16 of the 29 deaths were reported in the northern Mindanao region, while 12 of the 26 missing are from the eastern Bicol region. On the other hand, Defense Minister and Director of the National Emergency Center, Jose Faustino, said they continue to provide food, water, and other materials to help the families still in evacuation centers and other affected areas. In the United States, Winter Storm Elliott has left a total of 65 people dead so far, but authorities estimate that the number could rise. High tides with waves of up to 9 meters and winds of up to 130 kilometers per hour have been recorded in the northwest of the country. The conditions have caused road accidents and power outages in hundreds of thousands of homes. In the 40s in Portland metropolitan area, wind gusts of 97 kilometers per hour also down power lines and trees. Winter storm Elliot has already caused death in nine states. The Niagara Falls are spectacular for all spectators seen any season of the year, but winter and especially winter storms with freezing temperatures turn the flowing stream into a venison sculpture. Let's see. The winter storm that hit several areas of the U.S. generated the partial freezing of Niagara Falls and its surroundings. The spectacular winter wonderland shared by users of social media is the result of the sub-zero temperatures, which freeze the mist and spread off the falls, forming a layer of surface ice on the water. Progressively, these layers of ice accumulate at the base of the falls, giving rise to the phenomenon known as ice bridge, as the collection of ice can get up to 12 meters thick. The volume of water following beneath the ice sheets as well as the continuous movement of the Niagara River prevent the falls from freezing over completely. However, the U.S. side came close to freezing on at least five occasions because of floating ice blocking the upstream flow of water. Beginning in 1964, it was decided to place an ice barrier to control the potential damage its accumulation could cause. The 2.7 kilometer long fence is made of floating steel pontoons placed between the Canadian city of Fort Erie and the U.S. city of Buffalo. According to information from Niagara Falls State Park, about 3,160 tons of water flow over it every second at a fall rate of 9.7 meters per second. While the United States allocates billions of dollars to Ukraine for military equipment, problems associated with poverty persist in some cities of the country. The Hill newspaper warned on Wednesday that cities as Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles are among the 10 neediest cities in the United States. Observers warned that the enormous financial support provided by the United States to Ukraine overshadows the budget destined to solve one of the most pressing problems afflicting the country. Washington has already allocated $68 billion to Kiev, which added to the most recent congressionally approved funding of $45 billion would bring total spending since the start of the conflict with Russia to approximately 113 billion US dollars. 
Also in the United States, 43,567 people have been killed by gun violence this year. More than a thousand were minors. According to the Gun Violence Archive funded in 2014, 1,631 minors died and 4,400 others suffered gunshot wounds in 2022, while over 300 of the children killed were under the age of 12. This represents the second highest total of mass shootings since the tracking began, being this the third consecutive year with more than 600 of such incidents. These figures indicate a 324 increase in child fatalities over the previous year and a steep rise of 3,111 more deaths compared to 2014. Finally, the entity said that the majority of deaths from gun violence in the country have been in suicides, while over 1,500 unintentional shootings also took place. Nearly 60% of German trade associations are pessimistic about the economy for the 2023, according to a survey by the German Institute for Economic Research. Among the 49 German trade associations surveyed between mid-November and early December, 30 of them expect their members' output to fall next year. Meanwhile, only 13 expect output in their sectors to rise. Moreover, nearly 40 associations believe their members are worse than they were a year ago. The survey also shows that record inflation continues to weigh on German economic sentiment. Since the escalation of the Ukraine crisis, Germany has followed the Western powers launching sanctions against Russia. However, the effect of the sanction has put European countries in a difficult position. And we have more news coming up after the financial break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Saudi Arabia's pressure against Yemen increases. Invading forces block imports from Hodeida port, causing the paralyzation of port operations. Authorities of the Red Sea Ports Corporation describe as a criminal behavior the prohibition of import and entry of parts and spare parts of equipment and machines by the Arab country. Official Mohammed Ishak pointed out that the implementation of this measure is an aggression against the Yemeni people as it affects the operation of this port as an important source of humanitarian aid and basic commercial goods for them. Russia will provide Iran with two dozens of fourth-generation Sukhoi Su-35 fighter jets. The jets had originally been manufactured for Egypt, but the contract was cancelled under pressure from the United States. Media reports said Russia will be supplying Iran with a full squadron, that is, 24 units of the twin-engine and supermaneuverable fourth-generation fighter jet designed primarily for air superiority roles. This will likely further rile up the West as Iran and Moscow deepen their defense and economic cooperation in defiance of sweeping sanctions and coercive measures which, in the case of Iran, have created an opportunity for the country to diversify its economy away from crude revenues and to rely more on its domestic resources. Iran and Russia have signed major deals in recent months to boost their economic, trade, energy and military cooperation. As Ethiopia's northern conflict appears to come, resolving thorny issues remains a cornerstone for the former warring parties to achieve lasting peace. During the first visit to the region by a high-level government delegation since the signing of the peace deal, Deborah Tsion Gebre Marshall, the Tigray's People Liberation Front leader, insisted the nearly two-year-long war would only come to an end once Eritrean troops and Amara militias leave the region. The Tigray official accused the troops of invading that part of the territory, adding people were being killed. However, the Ethiopian officials have not said whether these fighters would disengage from the region. The country's national carrier Ethiopian Airlines resumed commercial flights to Tigray on Wednesday after a shutdown lasting 18 months. China's foreign ministry on Wednesday criticized Taiwan's decision to extend compulsory military service from four, more, four months to one year in a move that would only impact the Taiwanese. The official also said that Beijing believes that the population should not be used as cannon fodder but by Taiwan's separatist forces. His remarks came a day after the Autonomous Islands President Tsai Ing-wen announced the extension of compulsory military service, citing intimidation and threats from China against Taiwan. 
Tsai argued that the island would need better troops as their current military system is insufficient, especially in the event of a hypothetical attack on Taiwan. China continues to ease its strict zero COVID-19 policy and is moving forward in its efforts to coexist with the virus. The Asian country ensures it is in a new stage in the fight against the disease, considering the low virus infection rate of the new strain and the progress made in the vaccination campaign, especially among the elderly. Three years after the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, China is now entering a new phase in the fight against the virus by lifting the quarantine for travelers arriving in the country, as well as other health measures. Experts agree that lower viral loads, improved medical resources and progress in mass vaccination, especially in the elderly, gave China the confidence and strength to overcome the pandemic. The announcement that as of January 8th, China will reopen its borders and eliminate the quarantine requirement, a measure that had been enforced since 2020, has been highly anticipated and is an important step towards resuming normal life and also for international trade. Over the past three years, we have always put people's lives and health first. We made sure that patients with severe symptoms receive early treatment and have focused medical resources and trained medical teams. We are now in a new phase in which we will continue to work in a more focused way to protect people, but also to stabilize daily life. With these decisions, China is moving further away from its strict zero COVID-19 policy and moving towards coexisting with the virus, as is the rest of the world. However, the country's health officials confirm that this does not mean abandoning all prevention and control measures against the disease and ratify their readiness to deal with any risk in the face of a significant increase in the number of infections. In this context, Beijing is also working to increase and expedite vaccination against COVID-19, especially among the elderly, who are the most vulnerable age group in the midst of the new outbreak in the country, considered the worst since the outbreak of the pandemic. And days after China announced a relaxation of their COVID-19 control measures as of January 8th, several countries have put special restrictions in place regarding Chinese travelers. I mean, a surge in COVID-19 infections in the Asian country, Italy has announced on Wednesday that testing will be mandatory for passengers arriving from China. This happens only a day after Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida stated they would adopt similar measures, including a seven-day quarantine for those who tested positive. Malaysia has also put in place additional tracking and surveillance measures, while the United States has expressed its concern and said to be evaluating possible restrictions. Meanwhile, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenmin said at a briefing that measures by any country need to be science-based and proportionate without affecting normal people-to-people -people exchange. He also praised China's handling of the pandemic so far and denounced the political bias behind international media coverage of their decision to open the borders. We have come to the end of this news bureau. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesorenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.